Uh, and uh, did he did he lay out any specific instructions regarding Man and the Machine once he found out that his tumor had come back? Well, I couldn't tell you what he has written down. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like yeah, that, that's really not my place. Um, not that I'm just a dumb singer or anything, but uh, he and I did have our um, our final talk. And uh, he knew that there would be a lot of controversy about this record, and there was, you know, there was still controversy over the whole death and control the nine thing. You know, uh, you know, what the hell are you doing singing for death? Who are you? And you know, just kind of that attitude. Not so much anymore for when it first happened. You know? And uh, he said, you know, whatever happens to him, you got to stand up, and you have to speak out, and you have to fight this battle. You can't let these people run you over. And I said, okay, well, I'm a big boy. I can deal with it. And I did, you know, I, I kind of took that a little more lightly than I should have because it was a hell of a battle. It was a very emotional battle through all that. And with the, the war of words, they call it, between um, myself and the the president of that label you're referring to the blabbermouth uh dot net articles right sorry the blabbermouth dot net articles yeah 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 um you know the words are being hurled back and forth between james old Diener and uh you know guido uh i don't know how he says it's like behind it. whatever uh, <laughs> um, i mean you know I, I, it, it upsets me to even bring all that crap up again, you know. Yeah. And, you know, to, to be going through all that and grieving for your son, your brother, your friend, you know, and uh, just trying to make his state of affairs, just make things right. And to have this going on over top of it, 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 it was just totally bizarre. I mean, and, you know, and then... I I don't know whether he had, uh, and it, it, it's not fair to accuse him of doing it because anybody could have done it. You know, the internet's full of idiots anyway. True. You know, <laughs> and, and people, you know, people um, people get on the internet and they grow muscles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stay no, no, they would no doubt. Have, Especially never uh, say to somebody to their face, "Well, we had that shit going on too." So, excuse my language. Oh, it's, we're uh, Kason's not Kason's not FCC regulated, so you could say as That's colorful right. language as you want. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, Ultimate Guitar, that place is writhing with kids that, like you said, if if they had an opportunity to say it to your face. They would just shrivel up and run to, around the corner. It's ridiculous. And you know, I, I it, it's not fair to just to really blame it on Hammerheart or anybody, but it seemed like there were way too many trolls in the room for this to be real. Yeah. Somebody, the, yeah, they must have been planted. You know. So all that insanity was just really hard deal with and then and then there's 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 not all that just that shit going on i have a life of my own that's totally insane too <laughs> that just amplified everything it was it was a rough uh well the, the first uh four or five years were really rough I can imagine. Uh, how has uh, Chuck impacted your life? Because, I mean, I'm just looking at him as a person. He's a, definitely a great role model. Um, I saw Chuck as uh, kind of, he's, he's the, the exact same age as my youngest brother that passed away. My brother Danny and Chuck were the same age. So, you know, I saw Chuck as... And, and my, my, if you knew my little brother at all, he was a real go-getter, and uh, you know the best in his class. And uh, I think he would have liked Chuck a lot too. Um, so yeah, he re he reminded me, and it, and it seemed like that from the very beginning, like we had known each other for a long time. 
even, you know, after just hanging out for a week, it was a, a pretty strong bond there. And I couldn't wait to get back to be working with those guys again. And then once I was, that made that bond even stronger. And, the, you know, the kind of person Chuck was, I mean, you hear horror stories about it. Of course, you know, they say if you poke a dog with a stick enough times, he's going to bite you, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Chuck was like that, yeah, you know. Um, and, and, you know, if if you were acting like an ass, he's going to bite. <laughs> you keep on acting like an ass, he's just going to bite more. <laughs> you know, so, I, you know, the, I guess the moral of the story is don't act like an ass. And, and then you'll see the good side of Chuck, you know. And I think you can say that for a lot of people, you know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he and I just, uh, we clicked like that. We have, uh, we, you know, the harmonious attitudes, I guess. And it, that's really important in a band. We, you know, luckily, we did have that. I mean, you can... I'm sure there are a lot of musicians out there, a lot of bands out there that really don't have that kind of spark between them personally. You know, they're there, they do their job, and they're good at their job and this and that, but they're not really brothers. Uh, I've I've definitely had a few experiences with that. Yeah. But actually, I mean, my brother drums for my band, so it's uh, easier in that realm, I, I guess you could say. Yeah. And, uh... I mean, just speaking about uh, your family and, and Chuck and how that has impacted your life, I I, I might have heard somewhere that you uh, donate your hair to Locks of Love. Uh, is that true? And if if so, talk a bit about that. Yeah, uh, I ran into a guy um, about mm, it was right after Chuck died. What my mom had died. Watched her go through the whole chemo thing lose all her hair and everything and to see your own mother in that state it's it's disgusting and um after she passed away and after chuck passed away my hair was down between my pockets and my knees <laughs> at that time um if you, uh, if you if you see the the photo shot in um uh, Pharaoh's first record after the fire. That was that was my the length of my hair before I donated it for the first time. And um, it was a, a biker dude who um, saw me with my hair in a ponytail, and he said, "Hey man, when you're ready to get that cut, he handed me a, a business card from a from a uh, hairdresser." Take this card and call them and donate your hair to Locks of Love. It's the best thing you'd ever do with your hair. And I'm like, okay. And uh, was getting, you know, it's frustrating having long hair. I don't know if you have long hair or if you ever did. I used to. I had a. a but I used it, to have it used a, to be a, a real painted yes. I used to be like Messiah from Candlemas. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you're trying to sleep, and you got <laughs> you keep waking up, and you're you're you're, uh, <laughs> you're being strangled by your own hair, and uh, you know uh, <laughs> there are less glamorous uh, positions to, uh, to get in with hair in the way, but um, yeah, it was time time to cut it, and. I got it cut uh, about halfway up my shoulder. So there was about two feet, three feet of hair almost that I donated the first time. And then I let it grow out again. It took about three or four years to uh, let it grow out again, donate it again. And three, four years later, donate it again. And uh, the last time I donated it, I got it cut real short. Um, I don't know, there's a few pictures from uh, the the Faro gig we did over in Germany for the Keep It True Festival. I had a mohawk. Oh yeah, actually, I th- I, I know the singer of uh, Cage. The, uh, 
he told me about because uh, I, th I think I heard he was playing with you guys. So I was like, uh, you should say hi to him or whatever. And uh, mm -hmm. they were in the dressing room with us. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Because he he yeah. he sung a song on a on a record I did recently. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I heard about that. that was, was yeah, they're really cool. nice guys. They yeah. were they were fun to hang with. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, talk about but, talk a bit about Pharaoh. Well, I love talking about Pharaoh. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Pharaoh. Uh, that, that was a band that that came along. Um, the Jim Dofka, and and that it's important that I mention him because he's like really he's a he's a key figure in this whole story in this whole scenario because uh, what had happened uh, the way we got uh, the way. Chuck and I even met was uh, Jim Dofka and I had a band called Psycho Spring. And um, when I was interning at the studio and Jim and I had the band going and we lost the, the drummer and we lost the bass player and it was only Jim and I left. Uh, we kept on writing songs and demoing songs and auditioning players and weren't really finding the guys. I mean, you know, Pittsburgh isn't such a big town. There's a lot of talent here, but there aren't that many people. You know, so we're running out of options and uh, so well here why don't we look for guys dropping out of some of the more well known bands or, you know, some of the well known bands that are recruiting new guys. So got our demos together and Jim was sending them out. And um, another friend of mine, in the meanwhile, uh, D.C. Cooper from Royal Hunt at that time, uh, he recommended me for a gig over in uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, Fleming Rasmussen, who produced uh, Metallica, was producing this project, and they needed a singer pronto. And um, so, you know, I, I put the demos together for that, flew over there, but... I was sick. I had caught bronchitis. So by the time I got there, my voice was shy. I couldn't sing. Um, you know, gave him back the, the you know, advance money and got back on a plane with my tail between my legs and, and got back home. Well, the phone rang the next, I think, maybe two or three days later. And uh, Jim Dofka uh, said, I uh, guess where are you going now? And uh, to go, uh, you're going to go audition for um, Chuck Schuldiner. I'm like, huh? Mm -hmm. You mean from Death? Yeah, yeah. You're going to sing for Death, and I'm like, dude, I'm not a death metal vocalist. You know, how am I going to pull that? No, he's he's got another project, and yeah, you're going to fit right in. And uh, so, you know, that happened, and I uh, went and did the demos, and then when I came back from doing those demos. Jim Dolph again said, "Hey, I got a friend um, out in Philly has a band, and um, they want to hire you for for some songs. Uh, they're doing uh, some demos, or they're doing a compilation out. It was an Iron Maiden tribute." And I said, "Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, sure." So uh, Matt came out, Matt Johnson, guitarist from Pharaoh, and um, we went down to a little studio um, on the edge of down in Pittsburgh and um, flew in the vocals. You know, they had recorded on an ADAT and we just punched it up on the ADAT and flew my tracks in and um, that was our that was our first recording, you know, and it was just a, you know, singer for hire situation. Didn't think a whole lot of it. And um, after we recorded uh, The Friends of Art of Existence, again, Jim Dolph called and he says, uh, Matt Johnson uh, wants to hire you again for some more songs. And so we did another Iron Maiden tribute. <laughs> and uh, said, okay, yeah, you want me to sing Iron Maiden covers? Yeah, sure, no problem. So uh, 